Rise Career Exploration is financially supported by listeners like you. Every dollar helps towards future podcast episodes. Click on the link in the show notes or visit us at risecareer.org today. Thank you for your support. Enjoy the show. And remember, together we rise. Four, three, two, one. Hey, welcome everyone. I'm your host, Corey Alexander, licensed school counselor, author, and entrepreneur. And this is Rise Career Exploration, the podcast, where we interview guests on their professional journeys. Choosing a career can be one of the most difficult decisions of your life. Join me as we interview guests on their professional journeys. You'll find that the twists and turns of career struggles aren't unique to you and that the path to your dream profession isn't always a straight line. Whether you are a student who wants to learn what it takes to be in a specific career, or just want to hear some great career advice, this podcast is for you. Hey everyone, it's your host, Corey Alexander, and this is Rise Career Exploration, the podcast. Today's guest, David Tyree. He's a pastor, husband, father, author, entrepreneur, motivational speaker, former professional football player, Super Bowl 42 champion with the New York Giants, the 2008 SB Player of the Year winner for the helmet catch, co-owner and operator of Clean Juice, located in Morristown, New Jersey, and podcaster of Catch the Moment. Please welcome David Tyree. Good morning, man. How you doing? Oh, good, man. We're getting there. Is this a normal time for you to wake up? Nah, well, yeah, 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 yeah. It depends. You know, everything's about what we're trying to achieve in the day. You know, all these all these different schedules, you know, as the kids get older, the schedules get a little more robust. Yeah, yeah. So, um, so during the summer, yeah, like, you know, some days, well, Fridays, Fridays is a early, early, that's kind of like a early, early prayer day. Um, so I, this this worked perfect for, for I, you know, I've been trying to, I just, I just signed the boys up for Cobras. So now my evenings are shot. Um, so that's like Monday through Thursday, six to eight. I'm like, oh my God. You know, usually evenings is my go-to. <laughs> so we good, man. I mean, like, but, but other than that, we're typically up and, and like moving around the house between seven and eight thirty, you know. So not too bad. All right, got you. So you mentioned your children, you have seven. Yeah. The oldest is and the youngest is. Um yeah, Tayon's twenty one and Alina is ten. And how long you been married? Nineteen years. Nineteen years. All right, I got you beat by two. You got me. <laughs> yeah. All right, so I want to thank you for taking the time to speak with us, and um, let's jump right in. Awesome. All right, so share with us your high school and college life. Who was David Tyree in high school and college? Oh, man. Um, definitely an Essex County kid in early years in East Orange, New Jersey. Um, you know, great great part of East Orange, but, you know, you can go right around the corner, find, find, find troubles outdoors. And Montclair, I moved to Montclair when I was in the fifth grade and it changed my life. It changed my life, it changed my trajectory. Um, socially, the kids were involved. You know, not only was the town, you know, um, very diverse, which is known for, but, you know, socially, sports was a big part of the social uh, construct. And that's where everything really came alive for me. So, I mean, I definitely found my, my challenges in, in high school, um, looking for acceptance, crowds. Um, early arrest, seventh and eighth grade, just, you know, some of it foolishness, some of it just really making a ton of bad decisions. And But I think around high school is when I locked in on football and um, it created immense opportunity for me. Uh, started getting attention from schools, sophomore, junior year. And, uh, you know, that really just, um, you know, it, 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 it gave my life a lot, a roadmap that I probably wouldn't have had 
if I wasn't engaged athletically. But um, yeah, I definitely found a lot of my social vices and you know insecurities with alcohol, um, you know marijuana, the ladies, you know just kind of um, living in my, living in, our, in, the, in the social construct of my time, and those became major vices that carried uh, with me all the way through 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 Syracuse. And that was, you know, like I said, as, as much as that was a unique opportunity, athletically, full scholarship. Um, those were intent. I would call the, I would call those the darker years on the on the side of, you know, distractions and not really be not really um, firm in who I was as a man. So I had tremendous opportunity, obviously, as an athlete. Um, I was intelligent enough to kind of flourish at a great university, but those were blackout years, binge binging years. Um, alcohol-wise, and and I was just fortunate to have some a passion for the sport that gave me, a, 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 I guess you could say, a, a, a value system or a visionary um, pillar to not completely destroy my life. Because there were definitely um, things in play that through high school and college that were destructive behaviors. But I was, like I said, I was very fortunate that the love of the game really guided me to a, a healthy experience, um, you know, with Montclair, Syracuse. And um, there was a lot more positive, but, but definitely um, meaningful experiences that, that led me to some unique opportunities. Yeah, amen, amen. Um, when did you realize that being a professional football player was in reach? That's a great question. It was actually, it wasn't until, it wasn't that much of a thought in my mind um, until actually I got the news that Liala was pregnant with her son in college. So um, my oldest son, Tayon, is 21 years old. And um, I wasn't really, I didn't really look at myself as successful enough to begin to think about the NFL um, at, up until that point. But it was when she told me that he was pregnant where my, my thoughts as providing for a son, you know, really came like, wow, like I want to give him the best. I want to, you know, not have the care or concern or fear that I'm going to be able to provide the best experience for him. And that was actually when I said, maybe if I could parlay this special teams thing and give every time I step on the field, I had the image of my little baby boy as I went to the line of scrimmage. So that was actually the first time was kind of moving toward my senior year at Syracuse. All right. So that was your why. We all need a why. So absolutely, however you could get it. That's awesome. Family is definitely a great motivator. Um, yeah. So you went to Syracuse. How vital was your degree in consumer studies in preparing you for opening a retail business? You know what? I wish I could say it was a little bit more. I, I actually enjoyed getting my degree. I think the experience as a professional athlete, and uh, you know, depending on how useful your degree is, uh, consumer studies is one of those very broad. It's a very broad um, avenue where, obviously, within every industry, there's a consumer. So to, you, you probably need to specialize specialize, or get right to work, put that degree right to work, whereas a seven, seven year gap in between college to being a professional athlete, I didn't even know, I didn't even know how I was gonna use it. So um, I, enjoyed, I enjoyed it. it, you know, I think, you know, my favorite class was consumer law, taught me some unique experiences, how to not get bamboozled. <laughs> that's what's up. No, that's yeah. good stuff. Yeah. It really was. It was some really ins insightful information in relation to the rights of the consumer. But you know, but but I will say that um, it, it, it was it was of course a, a, a valuable learning experience, and being a professional athlete really gives you insight and growth opportunity to so many different realms. So uh, by the time I stepped away from the game, I had different interests. Got you, got you. Um, in your book, More Than the Catch, a true story of courage, hope, and achieving the impossible, you write, the challenge that many people have is the ability to identify the greatness deep within. How do you suggest one goes about identifying that? You know, it's, that's another great one. I think, I think, number one, there is going to be a discovery process. The biggest thing that you have to do is get, get in the game, right? I said life is not a spectator sport. Um, so whatever it is, you, you know, we, we can't be fearful of the risk, right? Risk and faith are, are synonymous words. So that's, that's the first thing. Identify the, the areas of interest. It doesn't even have to be passion. What are you interested in um, that can create a roadmap to discovering what gifts are inside of you, um, whether you're truly 
have the fortitude and the resolve to remain in that particular sphere of influence or industry. And, and I think what happens is you begin to discover what moves you. Mm -hmm. And I define greatness two ways, impact or reach, right? So it doesn't have to be, greatness doesn't have to be some unique proposition. Um, when you when you get a chance to give someone your attention at a really high level, give them proper insight, that's that's tremendously that's a great impact on an individual's life. So greatness is, you know, within the reach of every individual. Got you, got you. And so that's why actually I did this podcast because when I grew up, I didn't have anybody saying, Hey, you should look into this or you should look into that. You should explore that career based on your personality. Maybe you might like this. And so I always had these questions like, what would it be like to do this? So that's why I had so many careers. I yeah. owned a barbershop, a record company. I was always like, whatever interests me, I would just go after it and check it out. Yeah. But in that, that's fun up until a certain age, but then right. it can be a distraction <laughs> at a certain point. So me having these interviews, giving people a look behind the curtain and information, they can make more informed decisions. So again, That's thank so, you for your time and coming on. No, I appreciate it, man. It's, it's, it's really great insight that you're actually sharing that because um, you do have, there is a time limit to exploration, right? Like we want to, we, you know, like if we're going to be really credible and have great depth in our experience or be a high performer, then you're going to have to kind of plant your roots. Yeah. And there's two sides of it. There's the sell side and there's the work side. I'm actually judgment index certified, which is a tool that kind of gives you a view of your values and your decisions, right? You know, and it, give, it kind of opens you up to certain blind spots because we have who we are as individuals. And then we have that's, you know, we want to have the same kind of commitment and energy on the work side. But if you're not, if you're disconnected in any way in your personal life, then that affects who you are in your work. So the sooner that you can get engaged and, and create depth, commitment, right? And um, kind of pay the price within a sphere. You'll get credibility and experience that will cultivate confidence. And you'll be more apt to, to really be, quote unquote, an industry leader or one of the best at your craft. But if you're not certain or sure in who you are, then you can kind of end up, you know, leapfrogging or maybe, you know, uh, pulling up roots a little too soon. So that's great, great, great. I'm, I'm glad you created this, 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 uh, this lane. Thank you. Thank you. And you said you're certified in that particular uh, yes. discipline. So when do you share that with a client? Like, are you, I, I, your intro is amazing. My, uh, so many different <laughs> um, specialties, but when do you sit with someone to go over that? Like, are you a life coach as well? And I, and I miss that. No, no, I would, I, I don't call it a life coach, but a coach. Right. And I think that number one, I have coaches and, there's nothing that I haven't had an interest in that I haven't got a coach for, right? So, um, whereas life coaches are well, you know, well vetted, it's not the it's not the moniker that I hold fast to, but a, a, a performance coach, um, an executive coach. I have I've worked with high performance athletes, so I found the tool okay. and wanted to formulate a plan. A lot of our athletes have blind spots in relation to some of their decision making. So if I can get a basis point, um, a starting point that will give them insight into certain measures or liabilities, it gives us a roadmap to create a strategic gotcha. plan on, on on development and improve. Gotcha, yeah, it makes it comprehensive and yeah, yeah, blind spots, yeah, good. Absolutely. Good, good. Yeah, yeah, because we all have them. We got them, we got them. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> and to be successfully married for 19 years and 21 years, we definitely have someone that's helping us with that as well, as far as, as well as Holy Spirit, Father God, yeah. Yeah, it's, 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 it's powerful. Even that relationship, it kind of, you know, I take, we take the similitude and the necessity, and once you're committed to, it, it, it gives room for growth. Necess I call them necessary sacrifices. Mm. We always want to try to make the, the healthy sacrifices, right? Mm. And um, but those are necessary sacrifices, meaning like, hey man, um, you know, some people call it compromise, or you know, you know, giving up, giving up your ideas, giving up your time, <clears throat> but making the necessary sacrifices for that which valuable. It's the same way as a high-performing athlete. 
you know, these guys didn't didn't attain certain um, measures of success without making necessary sacrifices, yeah, yeah, yeah. right? And I think that's the same way. It, 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 you know, we just don't want to make the wrong sacrifices in pursuit of yeah, yeah. money or fame or or you know something that's outside of a health value system. And I think that's really how you really kind of enter into meaning more purposeful. Um, places, you know, where, where you have a value system that's constructed on things that are that are that are meaningful and lasting. Yeah, yeah. Um, so this is a little off script, but so like I saw the Derek Jeter document documentary, and it showed how he didn't start a family until he was finished, and he had a little regret that he wished his kids were in the dugout, but he also admitted that it could be a distraction, and he was so focused. And he had a phenomenal career. Yeah. And then you had someone like um, Tom Brady that it kind of didn't work out for him with his marriage. But, you know, that's neither here nor there. Like, I don't, sure. I wasn't in the home with them. I don't know behind the scenes, but as the yeah. media portrayed, it was like pick football yeah. or us. So, like, are you helping athletes balance family as well? Like, well, in the role, I was in athlete development for eight years. So, it, yeah, absolutely. I mean, we actually did a, um, we had a Raising, raising Up Giants uh, where, where, you know, we talked about fatherhood, intentional, intentional, intentional aims to being better fathers. Um, we had, you know, um, mar marriage, you know, couples nights and things of that nature. So we wanted to create avenues where we could have discussions. We can have discussions on because these are the, the you know the, the wise, the significant others, and the and the roles of these athletes are playing ginormous roles, financially within the with, you know you talking about that's safe that's the safe space, and um, whether whether they're holding down fi finances, some are doing management you know things in relation to you know just kind of allowing that athlete to focus on the one or two things that's creating such a unique experience for their family, right? So. And if home isn't right, then it, then it, then it kind of can bleed right into the, 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 the areas of performance. So the self side, you're who you are. You know, we always bring who we are to some extent into the work. And if we can't manage, you know, some of the instability that life can bring us, then, then it, like I said, so it's to the benefit, but the purpose is for somebody like myself, that's what really matters, right? It's really at the end of the day, it's, it's not the temporal work experience. It's not the you know the opportunity to be a professional athlete or a high performing executive. It's that you would prosper in all areas in, in all areas, right? That you would have sound mind, healthy relationships, and then you're going to be far more fulfilled. But it's the process, and if we're not intentional, if we don't chart a little bit of a roadmap or um, take advantage of people and resources, then we'll we'll certainly delay the process. Yeah, yeah. Whenever a man is on an island, it, it, it's a it's a road to destruction. Um, intentionality is everything because we could be intentional about watching a game on Sunday, and it in is. the same way, we could be intentional about doing something with our children. So, yeah, intentionality so, is everything. Yeah, so you know that with that. Building the right habits, absolutely. Yeah, yeah habits, habits. Yep. Yeah. I actually have an app, a habit app, where I write things down, and it's regards to family, like. Oh, just yeah. staying on point like remember to do this remember to you know yeah. Yeah. who are you telling i mean like you know obviously <laughs> um seven, seven kids I, I, we laugh we laugh at ourselves sometimes i think we knew what we were getting into but not really <laughs> but at the same time it it becomes like a logistics thing so you know and it, and it really stretches and challenges um us you know um in relation to not just communication but you know, try to maintain the standard of of giving each and every one of them the best opportunity, yeah. right? Best opportunity. And, you know, even when we're tired, you know, like it challenges us to, okay, man, I guess we got to plan. We got to be more, way more strategic. Our logistics game, we got to step it up. We got to plan further ahead. We got to get some help. Whatever it is, we got to figure out how to do a, you know, create a strategic plan with it, even within the ecosystem of the family, just so that the kids can can maximize their opportunities and their potential. Yeah, they want to feel love. They want individual attention. With seven, you know, six want to be in a way. Yeah, um, yeah, it's 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 a real thing. So I applaud you on that. Salute you on just Listen, just because when I talk to other men, 
just being aware that they could do better or trying to do better or trying to plan, you yeah. already winning. The awareness is you already winning when you're aware yes. that this is important, that you know you got to work on this. Just the awareness, you know? Absolutely. Again, Absolutely. back to the blind spot. Yeah. So I no, applaud you. Yeah. You and I, your wife, I applaud you. I appreciate it, man. Say it to you guys. And like I said, you guys have been, obviously, you know, it's it's many people that inspire, right? And I think, you know, we, we, we understand the village, the, the, the demand and the need for community. We couldn't do it by ourselves. We, you know, we, we uh, it's just, it's literally impossible. Possible. <laughs> it is impossible. It says with God, all things are possible, but with God and his people and people, right? Like, and, um, and I think it's, I think that's the way it's supposed to be as well. Yeah. You know, and I, you know, I, some of us, it doesn't matter what kind of different personalities, introvert, extrovert preferences, as you as you evolve to certain areas of growth and responsibility, there are certain demands, mm -hmm. um, or we or we'll suffer. You know, and I, and I think that's just kind of that's what life tells us. <laughs> it, yeah, yeah, yeah. it shows us if if we just neglect it, things will come to a ruin. You know, yeah. and I, that's that's not where any of us want to be. Yeah, amen. Um, according to Sports Illustrated, seventy-eight percent of NFL players who are retired file for bankruptcy two years later. And after five years of retirement, 60% of NBA players suffer the same fate. Why do you think with so much financial literacy available and hearing about the history of players before them, these figures are historically high? And what bad financial habits did you personally witness? Well, I will say this, that, that, that statistic has been pr pretty well challenged. Uh, but I will say that, that it's... This, the challenge is certainly there before us. So financial literacy is really a hot topic within the last you know five to 10 years, especially with the rising ascent of social media and access to information. Where athletes have had great access to opportunity, they didn't have financial literacy. Most of, when you look, especially within the NFL, you talk about 78, about 78% of the athletes are minority. Um, so you know we we can we can kind of make a healthy assumption that where we're coming from and some of the challenges that where we're coming from, money is like a language. If you don't if you don't know Spanish, right? You don't you you don't know how to use it. You know the tools, and if you don't know the language, you won't know how to properly operate within that sphere of influence. And I think that's one thing. Um, my some of my personal decisions start the most important financial tool you have is a budget. At the end of the day, is if you if you just exercise the, the personal discipline to spend less than you make, it, it it's it's so practical and pragmatic. But the, this is not just the athlete problem. This is a human problem, of course, of course. right? It's a it's a national problem, covetousness, whatever you want to call it, on a spiritual level, or just keeping up with the Joneses as a moniker, and you know, no pun intended. <laughs> so it's it's. Um, so for my personal, I was an athlete. And I, I wasn't really a flashy-minded guy. I didn't have jewels. They had fancy car. I had nice opportunities. I had one major spend at a million-dollar home, and and making a million dollars a year. You would think, quote unquote, on paper before taxes, right? You would think that that was a, a opportunity that was could be well afforded. And all it took was no, there were no malicious. Um, you know, I wasn't necessarily maliciously taken advantage of. All it took was poor counsel, mm. right? Instead of buying a million dollar home, maybe I should have bought a seven hundred thousand dollar home, right? Um, you know, and because I'll, I'll give you one snapshot, it, it's like, man, million dollar homes that's two hundred forty thousand dollars down, right? I actually got a ten year mortgage because I wanted to pay the house off, right? Now I'm paying over a hundred thousand dollars a year out of pocket in mortgage. Right, like just just think about that over a few years, right? Just boom, okay, that's two hundred forty grand out of pocket. That's enough for 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 three years. That's five hundred grand before you even put a couch in a house. Mm. Five hundred, six hundred grand out of pocket, right? Just for the mortgage and a down payment. That is burning cash, right? And just not having the proper strategic plan for the unique window of earnings that an athlete has. It's a very small window yes, yeah. and no one can call the shots on how long it lasts. 
So when I think about where opportunities that were lost for me, it was just a lack of experience and a lack of high-end counsel. They, most people who are in the position to help these athletes, they don't want to lose the opportunity to earn off them. So they, they don't force them to make hard decisions. And that's what it takes to be financially astute as well as professionally astute. You got to make hard decisions that have the long game in mind, mm-hmm. especially when you have a short earning window that really gives you a, a potential head start. Yeah, excellent, excellent. Um, so my wife has the gift of uh, budgeting and our oldest son feels like the budget constricts him when it actually frees you up. Yes. The budget right frees there. you up. You allocate the finances in the budget line. When it time yep. when it comes time to enjoy that budget line, you good. You, you just good. go to the budget, go to the line item. You had put it there. You were intentional. Yep. And now you are free to fix the car because you had car repair budget line. You are free to go shopping because you had clothing line. You free to vacation. Yeah because you have vacation line. There you go. There so you go. practical there. Yeah, that's money. I'm, I'm yeah. glad it's coming from you. Yeah. Um, I hope people hear this. They just, somebody could just readjust and, and, and start winning. And listen, and, 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 but there's nothing more necessary, vital. You know, we get into investing and crypto and all these other, there's great means of opportunity financially and ways to make money, but it's only, it only matters what you keep. Right, <laughs> it only matters what you keep, man. Like, and, and at the end of the day, money is just a tool. It's just a means to an end. It's a promissory note, and it it, it doesn't even have the value that we kind of created. God, give, He tells us that He's going to supply our our. He give us shelter, and this is why I try to like spiritually. I was trying to ground myself. Well, God told me He's going to give me clothing, raiment, right, and food. So that's a real substance. That's actually what I need. Yeah. So he actually provides the things that I need, not money. Money kind of creates, it's a mirage that 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 gives, uh, you know, and it, and, it, and it clings to our emotions and makes us feel like if we don't have money, we don't have what we need. But the majority of people have what they need, man. I'm, just, I'm telling you. And we, we, we put too much credence on whether we have full bank accounts. And so I it, it helps me to set my joy as well mm-hmm. as, you know, put money in the right place so they could just be a means to an end and be thrown in my heart and mind oh man speaking to that person um yeah i just stand in agreement with you that this person i hear the person needs to hear this here's this good 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 stuff um if any of your seven children wanted to pursue a career in professional sports what would you tell them I would get ready to put the work in (laughs) yeah i think the the main thing that i would really lay before them is is the kind of work ethic i would encourage them you know uh, we launched the catch camp this past year and and the super bowl and it's feed the dream and paint the reality i want them to have the the most healthy expectation of what it's going to take pursue their passion um but not be um jaded about what it's going to take to attain that goal and i'm going to i'm going to help them do it with the best of my, my ability understanding uh, whether I understand the sport or or the or the sphere of influence, it, it's going to take the same thing in any particular realm. It's going to take dedication, determination. Going to take focus. Going to take tremendous work ethic. Going to take necessary sacrifice. Um, it's going to take some creativity. It's going to take other people. So it's it's going to take all those things if they're going to be you know be a professional athlete or a high performer within any in industry. Got you, got you. Um, what would you say is the biggest trap for college athletes? And when I mean, what I mean is, it could be mentally, emotionally, spiritually, anything that stops them from being their best self. Man, the biggest trap. <laughs> you know, it, there's so many, man. <laughs> you know, I think um, the biggest, if 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 I can be honest, is it's probably the the, the age old, the age old vices. Uh, you know, like. Gold, glory, and girls. You know, like mm-hmm. I mean, I think they, I think I think the and what happens with college athletes is they're uniquely positioned, especially now because of NIL opportunities at a higher level. Athletes, they're uniquely positioned to be at the top of the food chain to have access to those things, right? The glory that's associated with the sports, 
you know, at, at the end of the day, they're, they're, they're modern day Titans. And, you know, so it, cre it intensifies the vices that kind of, that, 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 that we all are subject to in some measure, but it really intensifies it. So I, I'm never going to deviate from, you know, uh, uh, the, 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 the female trap. I mean, like it's one of the greatest drainers of time and, 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 and focus and, and it's a natural affection, but it really, it really deters so many, it creates so many different distractions for athletes. And so, um, but in that realm, there, there, there's, there's so many temptations for the young man that, you know, and I think their love for their sport, obviously, you know, it's not, it's not tripping up the guys at the highest level. I was dealing with so many of these guys at, at the New York Giants and I love them all, but they hoes, you know. <laughs> I love them all, but they hoes, man. But um, you know, I think understanding what a healthy construct is will still allow them to be the best performer, husband, father, and I really want to see them flourish at the highest level. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's good. That's good. Um, what's your perspective on college athletes being paid? Oh man, I think they deserve it at this stage. The 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 business of sport. Has, has has been booming for for decades, so um, I think it's well deserved at this stage. But I do it still creates unique challenges for the athlete, for their families, and and they have to have a plan for it. So NIL just burst open three years ago. Name, image, and likeness. These athletes can now make you know money off the name, image, and likeness, whereas the universities have been doing that for quite some time. Yeah. <laughs> Right, and and I think that's that's just what it is. Like, it's 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 overdue only because so many hands have prospered off of their talent. They're not, you know, and and I think they have an opportunity to get a free education, and that's a part of it. But it hasn't been a fair exchange for quite some time. But we still have to equip them mentally, uh, financially, with the tools to manage some of these new opportunities, and that creates a new challenge. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, in your book, you write, the greatness of each person can be measured only by the potential inside. Can you break that down for us? Yeah, I think, I think number one, there's not, not all, I think that there's different gifts, talents, skills, abilities, and interests. So, you know, greatness is, is just as subjective as success. And only one's, you know, only the individual as well as maybe even some of the authorities or people who have the ability to see that potential can really kind of frame that, right? If if I can recognize, you know, my kids' spiritual aptitude, emotional aptitude, intellectual aptitude, I want the best out of who that individual is. I'm not gonna place a, a demand on them versus that's that's in comparison to their brother. I'm gonna mm. place. I'm gonna place a demand on them. That's in comparison to what I see working within them, and I think that's kind of where the potential lies. And once you know that someone is has a strong intellectual capacity, then it becomes a, a challenge when you see them unwilling to engage mm. those gifts, unwilling to exercise that that brain, unwilling to uh, put the work in because maybe they were intellectually gifted, but they didn't like working hard in math. Right, they didn't want to put the work in, and and they're they're only going to benefit when they're actually exercising their brain at a higher capacity. Your brain is just like a muscle, right? If the, the more you stretch this bicep, you know, the more you stretch it out, it's going to grow. But you got to stretch it. You literally got to rip up the muscle for it to expand and grow. And it's the same same in many different areas of life. Yeah, which is uncomfortable, right? Yeah, it is. <laughs> you got to get uncomfortable, like. You know, sometime I'm sitting in the office with my uh, students and I'm telling, I, I draw a little circle and this is your comfort zone. And for your comfort zone to expand, you got to get out of it. And then you have a new radius. Mm -hmm. and, and the more you get, so like you're a motivational speaker, now you're a podcaster, you know, mm -hmm. you expand in your comfort zone and True. the initial thrust into that is going to be a little rocky at first. It's, it's uncomfortable. I, say, I, I tell people anything new is difficult. Yeah. Anything new is difficult, but in order to chart new new um, chart into new arenas, life is a journey. So you know, so you know, I've lived in the transition and development space. 
So, you know, it's it's on the move. They're moving targets. So if you're not if you're not flowing, you're not growing. So you gotta you gotta you gotta you gotta flow in the river that life is moving you into. And that's that's what you said is it creates a new radius. You begin to expand your reach, your impact, your skills, right? You, and you don't lose the old ones. It, it just might be time to cultivate <laughs> something new, yeah, yeah, yeah. right? I still know how to ride a bike. I haven't <laughs> rode a bike in a while. <laughs> I've been driving a car for a long time, but I still know how to ride it. I'm just, I'm just not, you know, I'm not, I'm not on the, on the, on the circuit. You know, I'm not for the France, but I still know how to do the basics. So I think, you know, but as you, again, as you mature, you begin to realize, recognize what's, what's central to your purpose right what what really feeds you internally and you know i was fortunate to find something like sport that was so fulfilling that that i could do it at the highest level but i couldn't do it forever so i actually had to again it's the reinvention it's the are you filling your are you filling your your brain whether it's reading or developing new interests and skills that can last you a lifetime i say you, you, it can't be your purpose if you can't do it throughout the duration of your life, mm. right? And we have to be, you know, because we like to be, you know, like, and there's tremendous passions that I do believe that passion can fuel, you know, fuel things, but it's like being an athlete, you can't do that forever. It can't be your purpose, right? You know, there's certain skills. If, if, if you lost, if, if, if you lost something, and this is why we have to kind of focus on your identity, who you are, Right. And get and search some of those things internally and really align your purpose with things that are why you can help people forever. Right. Yeah. You know, you can serve forever. You can you can you know, so it's, it's things like that. I'm going to be a father as long as I'm in the earth. And you want to connect your identity to things that are lasting and your purpose to things that are that are serving throughout the course of your life. You're going to be working as long as you're alive. You want to be working. Um, it gives us, it gives us a sense of purpose, even if it's not our inherent purpose. So things like that, we want to kind of do, do our best to try to roadmap and, and grow and get clarity. Yeah, that's that's money right there because, like, I love speaking to students, helping them work out something. Like, so when I grew up, I had you know I had a good solid family, but you know it wasn't the marriage, it wasn't the father in the home. Yeah. So I had to find my way, and so. I became a school counselor because I saw a need and I filled a need. And just speaking with someone and helping them track through life, man, is so much joy in that in that one thing, like being an ear, being a sounding board, yes. being able to say, this is what happened to me. Um, and I'm actually an introvert. I like super quiet. So to do a podcast, you know, it's just service to me. You there know you what I mean? Know. Like, I just feel like I'm serving someone can hear something and be like, oh, and get that aha moment because they heard David Tyree talk about this and be like, oh, he did that. Maybe I should look into that. Absolutely. So just service. So I appreciate you and sharing that. That's, that's good money right there. And so uh, you mentioned passion. Do you suggest that your children pursue their passion or build on their skill slash gift that they possess and why? You know, I, I, I believe that, you know, as a spiritual man, I believe that there's practicality and spirituality as well. So I believe that if, if you have a passion, if you found a passion early on, absolutely pursue it. My oldest son was always interested in, you know, um, in his computers and devices and cybersecurity and things of that nature. And, you know, and, and, it, and it didn't work out for him because he was a COVID graduate. He was at NGIT. But, you know, he took a year off and now he's in the Air Force doing. So he's kind of still aligned with something that he had interest in for from 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 his high school years. Um, whereas, you know, whereas my whereas my others, uh, he didn't he didn't it, nothing clicked with him in high school. So what so I, I think that duty precedes passion. Mm. I think that duty is 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 this old faithful. <laughs> This old faithful wash pot that's been with us throughout duration, and that especially as men, we have to romanticize duty. You know, like we're gonna have inherent responsibilities that all, won't always feel good, that won't always look good, that won't always be sexy. And passion is one of these sexy words. Mm -hmm. And I believe that you can attain it because we live in such a dynamic country. Like there, there, and if you have a plan and a strategy, 
and you have a good sound brain where you're not trying to self-sabotage or, or ignore all the people who care about you, you probably can do something you're passionate about. Probably. But I don't make it a, a idol. I don't make passion an idol. And I think that when you align your gifts from within, you'll likely feel tremendously passionate about doing things that are naturally good at, right? Like um, gifts are things that are inherent, right? And and, and when, when you find that some things come natural to you, like my 18-year-old Josiah, he doesn't know exactly what he wants to do career-wise, but he has a, a leadership gift. Mm -hmm. And that's going to impact. He has a natural inclination to be willing to serve. So I said, so, you know, let's stay close to coaching. Like, you know, it's it's like you, you, he helps his brothers along. He shows, you know, he shows him, he shows him how to ball, you know, just little things. He just, he, he gets into the detail of service. So I would venture to say that as he aligns himself with avenues of service, that leadership gift's going to come to the surface and he's going to feel passionate about the results that come. Mm, mm. So I think I think you can marry the two, but I'm very practical. Um, you know, having six kids transitioning out of the NFL, five kids, I couldn't pursue my passion, right? I had to get I had to get a check because my my salary just went from in a few years it just went from a million to 600 to $100,000, right? And I gotta still take care of these kids, right? Like I'm looking at, I'm looking at earnings decline. Mm. I had, to, I had to ensure that I had income coming in to just practically provide for my family. And I, I don't think, I think there's everything right about that mindset. Yeah. Oh man, I love that. I, I had, I was in real estate. I hit a rough patch. I was working at Target midnight shift. Man, respect. I had to do what I had to do. I was a substitute teacher. I had to get in where I fit in because. Yes. This is your responsibility. Yeah, and if and if you if you only preach passion, then 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 you then you just out here like you yeah. know <laughs> throwing rocks against the wall and your family suffering. And I don't see the great and you know what it might turn around. We've seen the pursuit of happiness. I get it. I get. I get it. I get it. And I'm not. I'm not. And I don't. I don't feel like if there's a hardship that I need to endure. I'm probably not going to avoid it. <laughs> like, I'm not even anti-suffering averse. I think that God, you know, creates avenues of growth opportunities as well, where we're going to go through those seasons where we're challenged. But not not, in, not, in, not with not at the expense of just pursuing a passion blindly where others or even just yourself are suffering because, hey, man, I'm going to be a, I'm going to be a producer. Well, be a producer and, and, get, and get hit that ship at the diner, too. Be like, you know, you <laughs> I think you can do both. <laughs> well, amen, man. Just you know, you have a window where you're only responsible for yourself. Go nuts. Right? Go nuts. Check these things out. Go, go, go. Absolutely. When you start having responsibilities, you have to keep that in mind. We up early doing this as to still honor our family later when everybody yeah. wakes up. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Amen, man. Like people hear this. People hear this. Um what was one of the first and harsh realities you learned when you first turned pro? Man, ooh. You know, I think when I first turned pro, the big wake up call for me is this is a business, mm. right? This is a business. And when you're in college, everything's kind of right there within this nice general radius. And it was a wake up call for me because my character was being exposed at the highest level. Um, you know, I kind of was able to put on a show in college, whereas I was still smoking, drinking, doing my thing. And it's normal in the athlete, sadly in the athlete community, we have these vices, but we are who we are as humans. But when I got to the to the pros, I was I was coming in late. Those was fines. I was coming. I'm talking about. I'm drunk. I'm waking up. I got into an accident. I had. I got I got crashed twice in my like on the way to work coming through my clear. Like just because I was woke up, you know, woke up hungover. So, you know, so um and at the end of the day, you know, my like my massive turnaround came after my rookie year. I got arrested on marijuana possession, but it brought me to the conclusion that it was me. Mm. It was no one else but me. And 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 I was in that jail cell and I was like, I got me here. 
and I'm not good at life right now. And and, and, and thankfully, I was able to come to that sober-minded decision where there were, no, there were no more excuses about what I wasn't. I was not man enough to be a professional at that stage, 23, 24 years old in the National Football League. And those were the facts. And so that was that was my, you know, my 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 crossroad moment. And that was the moment where I cried out to God and life changed. So yeah, it was those realities of being a professional and what it was what it took. And I wasn't that at a high level, even though I had success on the field, off the field, I, I, I was I was I was a boy off the field. I wasn't a man. Mm, good. Thank you for sharing and being transparent. That's good stuff. Mm -hmm. um, it, 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 I'm sure someone's going to hear this and be able to reflect. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. It's, and it's the roadmap. I think, the, the, you know, now we're in a data-centric world. I think they say that the, the, the average male's brain is not finished developing until 25 years old. And, you know, 25 to 26 years old, I believe. So when you just think about these, especially some of the, the emerging athlete or even the young kid coming out of college, is that he's still developing in his decision making. Yeah. But like, we're just like, I hate to say it, but like, we're stuck on stupid for a little while. Like, we really think that we've arrived to a yeah. certain place, but we're just not there yet. So you still need these mentors, teachers, leaders, pastors, um, you know, co-workers, you need these examples. And if the, the wisest young man cleaves to the wisdom of, of, of his of his leaders, of his elders, and that keeps him safe as he's moving into different stages of maturity. Yeah, yeah. Speaking of mentors, what was some of the best advice you ever received from a coach but didn't take? Oh, golly. <laughs> didn't take. I, I I probably couldn't even catalog it, man. Oh. <laughs> um, the best advice that I that I got and didn't take. I like you feel, like you realized it later. Like what was that aha moment? Be like, oh, he told me that. Man, um, I think so much. Of, I, I was a respectably very coachable uh, athlete. I think it was it was the life decisions where I was really. Um, losing. I was just losing in life, but I was also putting on. I think my perception, I mean, like, because I meant well, mm. went a long way in relation to, you know, when you got guys who are stubborn, especially in, in the, you know, which is, you know, athletes, are, you know, we're, we're stubborn. We're stubborn. And that's part of our success. Yeah, our yeah, yeah. Success, right? Yeah. Um, you know, and it, it I was one of those guys that probably were favored because I got an easy disposition, even though, you know, so I didn't run into a lot of, a lot of, of those kind of missed opportunities. I think, I think, um, I think where, where, where my, where my lessons really lie, where, where, where we need to reduce the exposure of, of, you know, of poor decision-making. You know, because on the like, I didn't have the physical gifts as an athlete to get away with all those, all the all the unnecessary exposures. Mm -hmm. Obviously, I made it, yeah. but I'll, I used to always think about what would my production be like if I wasn't so reckless. So when you hear the Derek Jeter stories, right, that those were the missed opportunities for somebody like me. When I hear these guys who were playing at a Hall of Fame level, they were so holed in. It was one thing. It was, I have this window to be the best in the world ever. That was the mindset. When you hear the mama mentality, no, I'm up at 5 a.m. working. These jokers at the club. It was that mentality. And I think I missed some of those opportunities, okay. even though I made some some hard sacrifices to get where I, where I was. Got you, got you. Um, when did you start thinking about life after football? And do you think it was early enough? No, man. No, it wasn't. <laughs> I, I mean, I got born again after my rookie year, so in 2004, and I, I will say this. I gave all of my devotion to Christ from the moment I became a Christian. So um, all of my energy off the field went into my pursuit of Christ. You know, so it was conferences, prophetic conferences. Even back then, I was leaning in where most people weren't. I was in fellowship twice a week in the Word of God. I didn't have, in, in my biggest blind spot was not charting a roadmap professionally because I, I knew I was going to do ministry, but I didn't, I, I didn't see this pulpit type 
framework for myself. Not that I was against it because I love communicating and speaking. I knew I had influence, but um, I just felt like there was, you know, a different package, for lack of other terms. And I didn't put intent. I didn't create a roadmap professionally because I also knew I wanted to work. So I knew I had some communication gifts like media, but they didn't necessarily like, you know, the media world is really flooded and convoluted. And I didn't take advantage of resources that were available at the NFL. There were resources. I didn't go to those programs. I didn't go to those entrepreneurship programs. And that's how I was fortunate to, after two years, find them two years away, kind of floundering in the marketplace with my financial advisor, realizing that this wasn't for me. It was a stale year and a half working with him. And, and then I got, you know, I started taking advantage of those resources and found myself in athlete development, which was really, really fulfilling. It was really fulfilling to be in a position to have a certain measure of credibility, solidarity in who I was as a man, because I was strong who I was as a man, but I just went from being the best in the world at something, and now I don't know what I'm gonna be good at. Like, what am I good at, right? I can talk, but, um, you know, was I gonna be a professional speaker? I, I didn't know how to chart a roadmap to that. I can, I had opportunities. I had spoken for, you know, for different companies, you know, after the Super Bowl, I was speaking for, uh, the Ritz Carlton Hotel staff. So I had done some really neat things, but I didn't have a roadmap to do it. And, and so um, there were certainly missed opportunities of really, and I think that's what attracted me to the career in athlete development, the intentionality that we have to have to find, to, to get a predicted outcome. Yeah. And so I want to touch on your position as director of player development, but I first want to say to the world and everyone listening, David's story is real. And how do I know? I met you, you didn't meet me because you were the speaker. So I witnessed you come to Montclair to the restaurant, um, the office that no longer is open in Montclair per se. Mm -hmm. And Chris Boussard of King organization had you come speak to us and you was just professing your love of Jesus Christ to this group of men. And yep. I witnessed you and I met you. I witnessed you profess your love of Jesus Christ at that moment. And mm -hmm. um, I'm, I might have shook your hand and but mm -hmm. I left impressed, impressed yeah. with your walk. And so, yeah, you was out there. Appreciate it. Yeah, yeah. Um, so speaking about director of player development position, how did that come about for the Giants? Yeah, I had two years prior for 2012 was my first year in the National Football League. Troy Vincent's a really close friend, mentor. He actually contributed to the book in the Hall of Faith chapter, more than just the catch. He's a top three executive easily at, at the National Football League. And at the time he was the he was the he was uh leading the the entire group at the NFL office. So two years working under Troy, in my brain, I was actually gonna try to write my own position, um, like as a because leadership is an innate soft skill that gets cultivated in sports. You know, you get a lot of strong soft skills um, in, 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 these, in the working within sports and being impacted in the sports commitment, um, you know, all these virtues and values. So I was actually gonna curate my own role for the, I was gonna try to, you know, create a leadership role within the NFL office. But um, the Giants had just, tra you know, Charles Way was in that position with the Giants he ended up getting Troy's um, former position as Troy took the operations job where he still is, I believe he's the senior vice president. So it was a little musical chairs. I was at the league office. I went over to the Giants, I interviewed for the for the position. It was open. Charles Way, who was a Giant, he ends up coming to the National Football League and Troy ends up um, you know, taking a, taking the elevator up to a higher position. And it was a homecoming with, with uh, the team that drafted me in 2003. And it was special. It was special to come back home, have the opportunity to serve those athletes and, you know, give them the insight, wisdom, and try to just work with them to be better men. And better men make better players. Yeah, yeah. So what was like a what was a day like as the director of player development? Like you go on this Monday, yeah. you could be doing what? Well, you know, there's 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 certainly the the some some of the administrative elements and, and kind of so there's programming, there's there's resources, which is just, just strict information. Um, but the role really focus, a, a large chunk of the role focuses on first year and second year players. 
So we have we have mandated rookie rookie programming for the athletes. Mm. So it's kind of like a I'm a transitory vehicle, and not just off the field, but folk, a, a big chunk of it off the field. Um, what is your NFL experience? What are the expectations? What you know? What is the expectations for the culture within the New York Football Giants? Um, and so it's, some of it's just job responsibilities, resources, benefits. Right here's your here's your benefits, life insurance. Um, so we're giving them the the holistic view, lens, and opportunities so that they can flourish on and off the field. Family. So we're doing orienting or you know um, orienting them to what their um, you know what their family situation with. So it's really a you are literally a conduit to safety and security for the athlete at the professional level, and that's what the intent of the role is but you're also a liaison between the players and management and coaches so it really takes a, a, a lot of um <laughs> you know you know it, it, you know you you can easily be perceived as a snitch yeah <laughs> i was gonna say like if something was going on with the player how do you finesse telling a coach like keep an eye on him he's going through yeah. something personal but still holding the confidence of the player that's that's actually a big part of you know you know gaining the trust of the athlete. You know, at the end of the day, is if it's something that has their welfare and safety involved, then that that ha that's going to have to go up the food chain to a respective measure. Um, you know, because you talk, you know, like you're typically the first point of contact in most cases. Um, coach is always going to be close to the athlete, so it's, it's you know like there there's there's play there. But even if there's something legal, um, you know, um, health wise. You know, off off the field, you know, you know that's you're 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 gonna be a um, you're gonna be that 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 first point of contact to create a roadmap as to how how you're gonna help them to figure that figure that situation out. So so number one, you never want to violate the players' trust, right? At the end of the day, is you have to create a, a safe space where 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 transparent dialogue can can, can go forward. And, and, I, and I have I have these failures to give me an avenue of understanding to these players. I understand how you jack it all, right? But also understand how you can create a roadmap to high level success. And that's what my career, my experience actually showed the athlete. And so let's focus on all the opportunity in front of us. Let's focus on all the, you know, and obviously they're only focused on what they want to focus on. That's the <laughs> fear. <laughs> and that's reality, all of us, right? That's it's people. true. It's true. It's true, and that's that. Actually, is the focal point. I can't act like my role is is the reason why they come to work. My role is, you know. So I just try to create. You you want to create a, 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 a an environment mm -hmm. that welcomes them yeah. to just be them. Gotcha. And then you get whatever they're dealing with. Yeah. So um, you know, and some of that, like I said, is it, you, you got to come down to their level. Whether that's text messaging, video games, all all this other stuff, you got to come down to the level of the individual that you're dealing with, so that hopefully you can create a, an avenue where there's true connection. Yeah, yeah. I mean, as a counselor, that's what I got to do every day. Um, every day. So I have students that come into my office and say they want to play professional football. Um, I work at Hillside in Hillside, New Jersey. The football team is pretty good. I feel mm -hmm. like if I hit them with the stats on their chances, I'm a dream killer. So what would you tell them, being well, that you've been there, done that? <laughs> I think that I think that you can do both. I think that like you said, well, listen, I think that's fantastic. It's a worthy, it's a dream. You know, um, you know, with one percent of the athletes at the high school level making the NFL, it's a dream. But you can be part of the one percent, and I think that that's a that's it, it, it's shocking to hear it. They might not fully understand it at that age, and they probably you know they're not interested in that in those stats. But at the same time, they're going to have to, you know, and, and I think you want to have a plan. There's one of my favorite scriptures, many plans of a man, but it's the Lord's counsel that will stand. So I think that it's never too early to create a roadmap. Um, but at the end of the day, there's so many things that have to happen the right way in order for someone to become a professional athlete, mm -hmm. right? There's so many, it, it, and I don't call it luck because the people who get there They've created that roadmap. Yeah, yeah. But they there's, put in in, there's there's injuries, there's politics, there's so many different things that you're gonna obstacles that you're gonna have to overcome 
to crack through that thing and even just to make it right one year, two year, three years, right? The average career is 3.2 years. So there's so many things that have to happen for you to get there. Um, you have to be so intentional. So, but you also have to have the physical DNA makeup. Like, hey man, like five, six, running four, seven, ain't gonna make it, right? <laughs> right, it's, it's just certain things, you know? So I don't feel like we have to crush it. I feel like we have to guide and nurture it and at the same time have this other conversation, mm. right? Like, well, man, well, don't ignore what you're good at right now. Mm. Don't ignore what you're great at right now. So if you're if, if you an A student in math and, and STEM, well, listen, there's more billionaires than there are professional athletes right now, right? There, there's, there's only a few hundred players a year that are gonna be on these teams, right? It's more billion that even if you can add the guys that's gonna play on reserves, the guys that pull it into the through injury, there's more billionaires than there are NFL players every year. Wow. So how about we actually focus on what's lasting, right? So you know, and I'm not I'm not self creating a, a thing out of out of money, but success is relative. Yeah. So we can feed the dream, we can pay the bill. Amen. Amen. Um, you transi transitioned from being director of player development after providing industry recognized exceptional quality of service. Can you speak to your transition to Clean Juice, 100% certified organic juice bar franchisee, and the timing and circumstances of that transition? Yeah, it was uh, COVID. You know, I was actually, you know, I saw that I was going to try to start charting my way out of the development space around 2018. Front office was tough. Um, obviously, anytime that you know you have transition to leadership, it was a lot of transition in the Giants culture. At that time, every two years there was a change, and um, you know I was like, you know what? Let's let's start with a franchise concept. I had I don't have have a lot of business experience. Let's get a playbook, and let's you know let's let's pick something that we like that we can align with, and that's how we started with Clean Juice. And next thing you know, you know I was hoping to, we were hoping to open in April 2020. COVID hits in March. I uh, end up not renewing my contract with the Giants in May. And now we got to open our store in June and I'm unemployed. So it was far from the play that I was looking to run. I was hoping to renew my contract. I was I was doing I was one of the best at what I did. And um, that was not the play that I had in store. God called an audible. And next thing you know, we're just full time entrepreneurs in a, in a whole season uh, with a with a franchise system. And um, I think I'm still I'm still okay with franchising, but it has to be the right concept um, that is hopefully in business you're in it to be profitable. And it, it was never that, so we're going to be going through some some shifts even with that store concept here here very soon. Um, look out for, for Tyree's table in the same location, um, so in 68 South Street. Um, and but you know, but I really saw that you know what. Um, it was time to allow my life to kind of begin to speak for me. So in this development space, um, as a speaker, a coach, so now I'm doing work with that. And we launched the podcast to be a platform to just, just allow, allow our life and our voices to impact others. You know, we have so many different experiences as parents, as leaders, as servants, um, where we wanted to connect people's stories their process, their journey, their pain point, so that people can see that success is relative. You know, we want you to catch your moment, whatever that moment is. And um, even you, you're doing it right now by allowing your your area of influence um, begin to, you know, re reverberate and use this medium to impact um, others so that they can get clarity. It's the same, 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 same opportunity. So that's, you know, the catch has afforded me a lot of areas of impact and I just, you know, we're still working to amplify it in a way where it continues to serve others. Yeah. And just so the world's clear, when David says we, he's talking about his lovely wife. Yeah, we are his one. His teammate, his partner. <laughs> yes. yes. Leala Tyree, she's special. Yes. She's special. Um, so, yeah, I mean, everything that we're doing can be found on my website, davidtyree85.com, um, you know, Instagram and LinkedIn, the most active social media channels. But it's, it's always about truth, transparency, and transformation. That's my company, DT3. Those are my three T's, my three pillars um, that I live by within my heart. And um, and ultimately, everything we do to glorify God. Yeah, amen. I'm going to put everything in the um, show notes for sure. Appreciate you, Ben. Um, 
The next to last question is from the Hillside High School Commons three-time champion football coach, Barris Grant. He wanted you to speak about the importance of selecting a college major as it pertains to the different opportunities there are to work for a team. Can you name a few positions that students might not be aware of and what major will prepare them for it? You know, when it comes to college, I'm, I'm very big on specific um, getting skills. I'm very big on coming out with skills. Um, humanities can be very broad subjects. Arts and science can be very broad subjects. What is the skills that you're developing to bring to an organization? So when I think about if there's a few um, careers that, you know, I, IT, cybersecurity, um, these are these are evolving, you know, AI, machine learning. The analytics world is is moving. The, the, the business of sport is fully mature. And I think that, you know, sales, you know, sales is a skill. It's really, a, you know, it's a, it's a charismatic. But I think that those are the things that businesses thrive on skills. What are your contributions? So, you know, so when I think about the business of sport, if there's, if, if I would pick a few majors, it would be something, it, it, things within computer science world, IT, computer science, um, analytics, or, or um, you know, things that you can, you know that you can bring value to an organization. The the sport side of, 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 of working in a sport, all people business. All people, businesses, all who you know. Ninety percent of it is who you know, not what you know. They'll, and and I think it's always been that way in business. But in relation to college, if you're going to put put down money to go to college, you need to come out of it with something that's valuable. Get something like engineering, finance, uh, things that no one's questioning what you're bringing to the table. Versus, you know, some of our others, you know, like we need more teachers. It's, it's like it's. it's that's that's a that's a skill right like at the end of the day there's but at the end of you know like when you when you talk about putting six figures down etc potentially get something that you know you can get some roi on so those are some of the things i think of when i look at college and opportunities are fun. yeah roi return on investment i speak to my students i speak to my children at home all the time pick a major that's going to be a return on investment College is an investment. College is a business. As, as excited as you are to get accepted, they're counting on you writing those checks to attend the classes as well, and they benefit greatly. Um, well, so, good. Mr. Tyree, yeah. thank you for being transparent. We've come to our last question, but before we go, please take this opportunity to tell our listeners what they can come to expect from your podcast, Clean Juice, and anything else that you'd like to share. I uh, appreciate it, man. Yeah, I mean, as, as stated, a um, lot of exciting, a, a lot of exciting transition with the store. Uh, we'll be kind of, you know, moving forward from Clean Juice up under the umbrella. It'll be Tyree's table. It'll be a similar concept, but um, it'll be something that, you know, is continuously serving the, the community in Morristown, New Jersey. Uh, my wife has been dynamic um, transitioning into business herself with that. And for myself, you know, um, yeah, any any schools, colleges, or businesses um, using my platform, you know, kept, have a few talks on our website, David Tyree eighty five, um, where where you know self awareness is a superpower. I'm big in the emotional intelligence space. Um, so when it comes to development, leadership, leadership development, and transition, those are topics or areas that I love to um, allow my story to come in. To bring um, to bring impact to those communities, so that they will be motivated and equipped to excel in any in any area or task that they're given to do. So, here to serve. Catch the moment podcast is available on every platform. Um, you can continue to get inspiring stories that that are aligned with your mission and how to get you to your roadmap to success. So, just 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 allowing God to move, allowing the catch to be a vehicle of of influence, impact. And uh, everybody, you know, get, getting great done on a daily. Amen. Amen. Thank you. So our last question is this. If you could text your younger self, what age would you text and what would the message be? What age would I, what, like, what, what would you be? What like, age would you send a text to? Okay. So what, so how old I would be? If, yeah. When you, yeah. When you send that text back in time, 
What age right. would you send it to, and what would the text message be? Oh my gosh! All right, <laughs> I would, I would send, I would, I was, I would send it to David at somewhere around. Oh my goodness! <laughs> All right, let's go with, let's go with, um, let's go with ten years old. Wow! And probably say something like. Um, I would probably say you will you will call for great things. You will, you don't need the world's approval to enter your destiny. Mm. And I think that you know my longing, and I think every human longs for acceptance. And 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 I think what I would want young David to know is that you need to get it in the right places. You need to find your people, find the people who validate who you are versus going into the ecosystems to gain acceptance and changing who you are to gain acceptance amongst people that appear to be something that they're not. Amen. Thank so, you, brother, for your time. Bless you, your family, your business ventures, your life, your, your service to others. Um, we appreciate you on this podcast. We thank you for sharing and we um, know that what you shared is going to help others. Salute, family. Salute. Appreciate right, you. Have a blessed day, a blessed week, a blessed weekend. God bless you. Thank you so much. It's already done, Corey. I right. right, appreciate you. Thank you for spending time with us. Please share, review, and subscribe now. Follow us on social media where we post new guest alerts and show recaps. All the information will be in the show notes. Thank you and be blessed.